ABC Wednesdays. Y'all can play all day. We want books. We want paper towels in the classroom. Bet you want raises, too. I'm Honey. still waiting on the paper towels. Abbott Elementary returns with the new season. We asked the district for more after-school programs. They gave us $50 for class pets instead. Critics cheer. Abbott Elementary continues to be one of the funniest and most beloved shows on TV. What y'all doing out there? Taking bribes. Proud of y'all. Abbott Elementary, Wednesdays, 930, 830 Central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. That's what you'll feel with Bolin Branch's best-selling signature sheets in 100% organic cotton. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bolin Branch sheets get softer with every wash. Start getting your best night's sleep in sheets that get softer and softer for years to come. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee, plus for a limited time, get 20% off your first order at BolinBranch.com. code SPAN. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Hi there, Joanna. Hello, Nate. And hello to all of you, and thank you for listening. We are Stranger Than, a podcast discussing unsolved mysteries, weird occurrences, misunderstood phenomena, and creepy happenings. This time, we will be talking about freak shows. When a baby was born in ancient Sparta, it was not the property of the parents. It was a property of the state. Shortly after birth, the newborn was taken before a group of elders who did a sort of school APGAR test. If the child did poorly in the test or looked sickly or had some kind of physical deformity, it was law that the child would be put to death by exposure. Usually. In the early Roman Republic, around 500 BCE, a child born with any kind of physical or mental malady could be legally killed by the father. In fact, it was the father's right to kill, mutilate, or sell any of his children as may be his want. Wow. Yeah. Imagine that. You know, you mind or I'll sell you into slavery, you little bastard. I actually wish I had that threat, you know, to get, and that it would actually hold, yeah. hold water there. <laughs> yeah, you could actually do it. I mean, maybe at a young age you could trick him into it, but... Once they get to be kids are way too smart now. They know what's legal and what isn't. You can't sell us into slavery. Mm -hmm. You can't leave us by the side of the road. That's not legal, Mom. We know what your name is. (laughs) The Romans did not have an equivalent word to disabled. They used the word monstrum, and the birth of a monstrum foretold misfortune and catastrophe. Aristotle said, Let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. Plato believed that the medical treatment should only be allowed for those who can actually get better. Those who can't should not be given medical attention, and those with congenital maladies should be put to death. Wow. Yeah, I thought pretty, he was such a reasonable fellow. Yeah, they were pretty hardcore about shit back then. Mm-hmm. In 3rd century Athens, a newborn was not considered a child until a week old, making it easier for the family to kill it if they saw something they didn't like. You don't feel quite so bad about killing something if it's not seen as a human. That's true. In the 2nd century CE, there were special markets where you could purchase dwarves, giants, and those with missing or malformed limbs, hermaphrodites, or anyone else with any kind of severe physical difference as a source of household entertainment. You could just purchase them for fun, then. You could just purchase them for fun. Like, I think I'm just going to have this in my house for... Fun. Fun. Yes. You could purchase one for your, your kids. That makes me think of, um, oh, you know, one of the newer Planet of the Apes, and they purchase a human, like the 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 ape girl, like purchases a human girl. Oh, was that the one in uh, with Wahlberg? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that part. I watched that one. I saw that one in the theater. It wasn't. I think that's the only one of the newer ones that I've seen. Actually, the three newest ones are really good. Are they? Yeah, you should watch them. They're good. Okay. Maybe after I get around to watching The Dark Knight. There you go. You should do that soon. (laughs) Those not up for sale could put themselves on display to earn a little bit of cash. Dwarves and hunchbacks were especially in demand as musicians and tumblers. So I guess at this point they've stopped making it so that they are just killed at birth and 
Yes. Now they're just sold in markets for yeah, people to yeah. entertain it. Well, this is well, they were being killed back in the way early times. Mm-hmm. And this is after the turn of the millennium. And so there, or the turn of the age, I guess, you know, it's going from BC to, to CE or yeah. whatever, whatever yeah. the fuck that is. Yes, they've stopped for the most part just leaving them around. In medieval times, congenital physical deformities were considered the result of the mother sinning. Obviously, it was the mother's fault. There are cases of women being tried for heresy because of these quote-unquote monstrous births. In 1512, Pope Julius II ordered a child to be abandoned in the wild to die. This child was born in Ravenna in northern Italy and, if real, suffered from several severe congenital disorders. It is said that the parents of the child was a nun and a friar. The child had a horned head, the letters YXV on its chest, one leg was hairy with a cloven foot, the other had a human eye growing out of the middle of it. It was also said to have both genders' sexual organs, wings of a bat, and a clawed eagle foot. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that must have been exaggerated because I don't think that there's yeah, any kind of just congenital anomalies that are actually all those things. Maybe maybe some of those things, but then... I'm thinking that in addition to just making things sound worse or whatever, better in some cases than they are, they were using things they were familiar with as to describe what they saw Mm -hmm. so it wasn't literally a cloven hoof but maybe one foot wasn't really there Mm -hmm. and there or maybe it was just a big toe or something and the other one could have been i don't know i mean chances are the whole thing was just it was like maybe a little bit hairy of a baby (laughs) there's nothing where you're born with like wings i mean there is no no, yeah there's there's a lot of stuff that you can be born with that is that's pretty crazy, but wing, wings ain't one of them. No. Working wings would be pretty cool, although you'd have to get all of your jackets tailor-made, you know, because mm-hmm. of wings. Although I, see, I, think, I feel like it wouldn't be that hard. you just have to, like, cut a hole in the back pretty much. Oh, yeah, but how are you going to get that? You'd have to be a big hole to get the wings through. Well, maybe your wings bend. Well, they bend somehow, but still, there's parts of them that aren't going to bend. There's, yes, but still. If you put them on, like... You know, you put the over the wings first. You know, you put the wings through the hole first, and then you <laughs> get your arms through and everything. I've got this all worked out. Okay, that's fair. Apparently, two years later, in Bologna, also in northern Italy, a child was born with two faces, three eyes, and a woman's vulva on its forehead. I'm not sure mm. which forehead or both foreheads, or if the two faces shared a forehead. Now, the two faces thing, I, I believe, because that's just a, that's like a conjoined twin thing. And the three eyes could also be that. Mm-hmm. They could share an eye. The vulva on the forehead. That's a little weird. Maybe that was just some sort of like weird fissure that they mm-hmm. just assumed was. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> well, they named it. looks the... similar, I guess. Yes. Yes. To them, at least. Mm-hmm. Maria, as the child was named, died four days after her baptism. Just as persecution of witches started to die down, so did the belief that Satan had anything to do with congenital physical oddities. In 1617, brothers named Lazarus and Johannes Baptista Coloretto were born in Genoa, Italy. Lazarus was a handsome man and perfectly healthy. His conjoined twin, Johannes, however, was a different story. Johannes was very much smaller than his brother, and the only parts of him visible were his left leg and his upper body, which protruded from Lazarus' chest. A little bit like Quado from Total Recall. Mm Mm-hmm, because, I mean, it wasn't like a... He was more of a parasitic twin than an actual conjoined twin. Yes. Because conjoined twins usually have their own nervous system, and they're usually kind of, you know, fully functioning separate people. This is not so much the case. Johannes basically just hung there and... If you poked at it, his eyes would open and it would, he would make like a a weird, some weird sounds occasionally. Twitch around a bit. He would twitch around and and look around, but other than that, he basically 
was non-functioning. His eyes were closed and his mouth hung slack. He was hanging upside down, so. Right. And he's not. But I think that's creepy. You can make his eyes open. It would just be like, kind of like, eh. That's creepy as fuck. Quaid. Yeah, start the reactor. <laughs> <laughs> but he ended up saving his brother. Johannes actually saved Lazarus. Oh, really? Yes, because uh, Lazarus once killed a man. Because the guy, like, teased him, and I guess maybe he was having a bad day and just couldn't take any more or whatever. Right. So he fucking kills the guy, but then the courts decided that they had to let him go because they couldn't execute him because then they would be killing Johannes as well. Oh, and nice. And Johannes was kind of innocent of any wrongdoing, so. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, totally got him off, off the hook for the death penalty. Well, I guess in a matter of speaking, he also saved his brother's life because to earn a living they went on tour and so they were making money off of it uh, he went to england even appeared at the court of king charles the first in the early 1640s normally now when he was just walking around the streets he would he throw a cloak over him yeah conceal his brother because i'm sure he didn't want to have to kill another motherfucker for making fun of his brother Mm-hmm. you know they had an x-files where they had a guy who had a parasitic twin and like all the it's a it's a freak show episode. It was a great one, but people are getting murdered in in the the carnival, and oh, it was actually yeah. the parasitic twin that was doing it. it. Was like, you know, I actually detach- think I've seen that one. Yeah, it was like detaching yeah. itself and like scurrying around. Uh, I totally remember and, that like, one. Killing people it was like, and be like yeah, because it was totally like this gross parasitic twin. It wasn't yeah. like a willing twin. It was nasty. That was one of the few that I've. Yeah, it had seen. it had the jigsaw puzzle dude. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. It is. It is. I'd forgotten about that one. Fortunately, Johannes was not able to detach himself and no, run not. around and kill people and Scurry, wreak havoc. Right. Yeah. It is unknown when the brothers died. There are some claims that Lazarus married and had several children, none of which were conjoined. It seems like sex would be kind of awkward with Johannes always hanging around. Oh my god, like flopping around, literally. Although I guess at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of privacy so much. I guess not, but still, ew. A fairly common practice. I mean, he's hanging upside down from his chest, okay? I know, right? I guess, yeah. Awkward. Awkward. I mean, his head's gonna be like banging into you one way or another. Or maybe it was like just... Just maybe they were good enough and religious enough that it was just for procreation, so there's no they weren't gonna be enjoying it. There was just a few quick thrusts and that was it. Maybe, but still, ew. Yeah, it would be weird. It's like what you wanna like can you get on all fours and I'm just gonna rest his head on your back? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably how it had to go down. I bet you there would be a website for that if there was websites back then. Oh man. I bet you it would have a lot of subscribers. Probably. There's some crispy six tickets out there. Well, people still enjoyed looking at people with biological oddities. And this grew in popularity until it pretty much really started to blow up in the 1800s. So oftentimes, people would pick up a manager and tour around Europe. And start right. getting, you know, beats the hell out of being a beggar and starving to death. Yeah. Slowly starving to death. I mean, if people are going to gawk at you, you may as well get paid for it. Right. Especially because at this time, they're still not, a lot of this time, they don't know how, why this is happening. Mm-hmm. In the 1800s, through medical knowledge and technological advances, people started becoming less superstitious. People with physical abnormalities were no longer considered tainted by the devil. In fact, mainly in England and America... People were quite curious about these so-called freaks, and this led to sideshows becoming big business. Not only would these sideshows display those with congenital abnormalities, but also people with strange talents. Sword swallowers, fire eaters, strong men, folks with full body tattooing, and magicians. Non-living specimens were also on display at sideshows, such as weird fetuses in jars and curiosities from far off and exotic places. And some of the best ones were, of course, like, conjoined twin fetuses oh yeah because most of those i believe full on half of those are stillborn 
Oh, yeah. Probably even more than half when back in the day. Right, when half were already, half of the babies were already going to die. Yeah. Well, you think about Chang and Aang, I, that still kind of boggles me. Because they were born in, like, 1811. Yeah. And, okay, they didn't have, like, C-sections. So this is, like, natural childbirth. You give birth to, like, two babies, basically, that are joined together. Like, like damn, that's... I wonder how many brothers and sisters that he has. I wonder if his mom was just spitting them out so he was... Well, they, she was, was used to it. Technically, they. They were two separate people. Right. But still. But still, Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, nowadays, I mean, conjoined twins still happen, but usually it's going to be C-section if they... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pull you out the mm -hmm. easier way. Mm-hmm. Well, in the early 20th century, it was still a good time for sideshows. Things like movies and later, sitting at home watching TV was not only more cost-effective, but also as comfortable. Additionally, people's ideas about what was appropriate changed. It wasn't really cool to go gawk at a person who was born with a physical disability. The laws also changed, despite many of the performers' protests forbidding the exhibition of quote-unquote freaks. Well, also, like, you know, some of these freaks were, like, kids and stuff, or they're men not only do they have physical impairments, but they are mentally impaired, and they yes. can't, like, legally give consent to be put on display and and this was new ideas at this time right in more modern times sideshows have had a slight revival but they mostly exhibit people who do crazy shit like hang from hooks stab to their skin or like fire breathers contortionists things of the like the jim rose circus sideshow is a well-known contemporary sideshow uh, the first time i heard of it was when nine inch nails and marilyn manson were touring back in the 90s Right around the time Downward Spiral came out. Mm -hmm. And the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow toured with them. Freak shows were at their biggest from about 1840 to 1940. Now there are several types of sideshows under two broad categories. There's working acts and human oddities. Working acts are the things like magicians, fire eaters, what have you. Human oddities are the dwarves and giants and whatnot. As far as the different sorts of sideshows, there's the ten in one which is the one tent that's got the 10 acts underneath it with the cover charge. Mm -hmm. This is the classic freak show model. It's where you could look on people with missing limbs, st styled as snake people, dwarves, giants, bearded women, the very obese and the very thin, oftentimes who are married, uh, tattooed people. They'd have a magician to break up the more macabre lineups in there. Mm -hmm. Many times there would also be a final act that was too disturbing for the general public or you know only for men those women and children are just too Delicate sensitive to deal it yes. yes you could also buy these baseball type cards that would have a picture of the person on it with a short background on the back it's like freak show trading cards pretty much there's single attractions which were called a single o these would be things like mythical beasts, infamous objects, or a particularly skilled magician, acrobats, something of that manner. Another type of sideshow is the museum show. This would be where you'd find stuffed exotic animals or things allegedly belonging to famous criminals. Like, this is Ed Gaines' house shoes made from one of his victim's feet. Ew. There's also the girl show, which are generally burlesque-style shows, sometimes completely nude, sometimes partially nude, sometimes fully clothed. Sometimes it's women with no limbs. Sometimes it's bearded women or fat women. There's all. Right. So that's about, that's the four main categories of the shows. So we have some stories of some of the individuals that were part of these shows. And some of them had pretty tragic lives. Many of them had pretty tragic lives. Although a lot of them made a lot of money being in the in the freak shows, lots of them, you know, eventually lost it and became poor. Some really fucked up things were done to them even after their death. Some of them, yes. So you mentioned the displays of women and the fat women. So one of the most famous fat women was a gal that was nicknamed Baby Ruth. Her name was Ruth Smith. 
Pontico. She was born in 1904 in Indiana, and she weighed 16 pounds at birth. Holy shit. Yeah, that is a big goddamn baby. That is, that's a whole lot of Rosie. Oh, yeah. And she just kept on gaining. She was in the third generation of women in her family to be featured as world's fattest lady. No shit. Yeah, so apparently, like, her mom and her grandma were also part of that. She gained about 40 pounds a year to keep up her appearances, and she was part of the um, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus slideshow, and she was 700 pounds at her peak. Wow. Yes. And at some point, she had to go to a hospital in Florida to have tumors removed from her legs, because when you get to be like that big you can't you have really poor circulation oh yeah and you get all sorts of well your heart isn't supposed to be pumping blood right through that much person right and so because of the poor circulation you get all sorts of like ulcers and skin problems cellulitis and it tends to get pretty bad pretty quick because of your lack of circulation it's it's the same as like you know diabetes except that it's all because you've you're morbidly obese right So, anyways, she had to go to a hospital in Florida to have some tumors removed from her legs. And as she was coming out of anesthesia, she began she began vomiting, which is pretty common. But the thing is, is that she was so heavy and fat, the nurses were trying to lift her so she wouldn't aspirate. And they couldn't. But they couldn't. So she choked to death on her own vomit. Oh, that's fucked up. Yeah, and that's how she died in 1942. She left behind a husband and a daughter. Wow. So that's pretty fucking sad. So she was born in 1904, died in 1942, so. Yeah, that's. So 38 years old. Not even, yeah, not even 40 years old. Yep. Well, I bet you physiologically she was. Probably well older than that. Well, let's go from the very large to the opposite. We have Isaac Sprague, the living skeleton. Also called the living mummy, too. Or the original Thin Man. Very sad. This man was born in 1841 and at the age of 12 started losing weight. In 1865, he joined a circus sideshow and eventually was hired on at P.T. Barnum's American Museum. After the museum burned down, Sprague went on the road in 1887. He died of asphyxia in Chicago, weighing in at 43 pounds. It's 19.5 kilograms. And I guess he kind of narrowly escaped death at that fire. I believe pretty much everyone who escaped narrowly escaped death <laughs> because a lot of people, a lot of things died. The whales they had there boiled in their uh, in their Christ. aquariums or whatever you call it, their that's, tanks. That's awful. Totally. There are a couple of beluga whales, I believe. Well, you know, they didn't have very good, you know, fire code back in the day. They did not. <laughs> well, why don't we take a minute to talk a little bit about P.T. Barnum, since he was pretty much the biggest name in all of this. Mm-hmm. Phineas Taylor Barnum. I would have gone by P.T. as well. Right. He was born July 5th, 1810 in Bethel, Connecticut. In 1834, he moved to New York City, where he began his entertainment career. He ended up buying Scudder's American Museum in 1841 and renamed it Barnum's American Museum. Barnum's American Museum opened for business January 1st, 1842, and was filled top to bottom with all kinds of crazy shit. It was basically a combination zoo, freak show, museum, boasting everything from whales to Siamese twins, and even a dog that ran a loom. It's a good boy. Wow. The museum was open until July 13th, 1865, when it tragically burned down. Many of the animals that were able to escape the flames ended up getting shot by police as they rushed out of the building. In 1868, Barnum's second museum burned down, kind of mysteriously. In 1870, at 60 years of age, P.T. Barnum started his first traveling circus called P.T. Barnum's Grand Traveling Museum, Menagerie, Caravan, and Hippodrome and Greatest Show on Earth. It went through several name changes until it was shortened to Barnum and Bailey's when he merged with James Bailey. And when did Ringling Brothers become a part of it? Well, they started in 1882, 
and they just were it was just five of them it was the five mm-hmm. ringling brothers they did juggling routines and skits and mainly they just did it in town halls to begin with but they were so popular that they ended up making enough money in 1884 to expand to a one ring show four years later they were traveling around in trains which just allowed them to get bigger and bigger and then in 1919 the circus merged with barnum and bailey's due to the world war and that's when it became Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey's Circus. Interesting. Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. That's what you'll feel with Bolin Branch's best-selling signature sheets in 100% organic cotton. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bolin Branch sheets get softer with every wash. Start getting your best night's sleep in sheets that get softer and softer for years to come. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee, plus for a limited time, get 20% off your first order at BolinBranch.com. code SPAN. Exclusions apply. See site for details. A lot of P.T. Barnum's freak show displays were pretty questionable at the time. Well, I wouldn't say at the time, but nowadays it's definitely. Oh, yeah. You look back at it with today's vision and it looks, it's just terrible, fucked up shit. It is. Like, did you want to talk about Zip the Pinhead? Yeah, Zip the Pinhead. So, pinheads are what they used to refer to people who are born with microcephaly. And it's just where you're born with a very small head, and then obviously your brain doesn't develop uh, like a typical person's. I believe that the reason the head is small is because the brain doesn't develop. Could be. I'm not sure. It's weird because what causes what? Yeah, chicken and egg thing. Right, exactly. I was about to say that. So that's something that's going on actually right now with the the Zika virus. Yeah, they believe the Zika virus causes mm-hmm. microcephaly. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, in Japan, there was apparently 11 women between 11 and 17 weeks of pregnancy that were under three quarters of a mile, 1.2 kilometers, from ground zero on the you know Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki mm-hmm. uh, nuclear attacks. And seven out of these 11 women gave birth to children with microcephaly. And this is the only proven congenital abnormality that can be linked to the nuclear blasts. Interesting. Yeah. So Zika virus and getting the nukes dropped on you will. Also, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome usually results in microcephaly. Do you remember we had one of those kids at our high school? Really? Was it James? I think that was his name. The one, the one who used to like punch and do karate oh like yeah by himself yeah he was yeah. a microcephalic really and his and he had fetal alcohol syndrome i don't really remember I, I just remember him because he was famous i guess you'd say right everyone knew him because he swam around and was doing the ninja moves Mm-hmm. but yeah poor james probably could have had a much better life had his mother chosen not to be a fucking alcoholic while she was pregnant yeah so likely yeah so there yeah so there's there's a whole myriad of reasons why you might be born microcephalic but back then they would call them pinheads and time billed as like a monkey man or a man right. monkey a missing link well zip the pinhead was billed as a man monkey and a missing link because he was black the other two there there's a few other pinhead pinheads that were famous they were um they were referred to like the last of the aztecs or something like that schlitzy the pinhead schlitzy the pinhead was billed as last of the aztecs he was also portrayed as a girl even though he was a guy he was in a lot of movies he mm-hmm. was actually in freaks yeah and the sideshow 1932 and 1928 respectively those were his first two movies but zip the pinhead was portrayed as a missing link because he was black and a pinhead basically which is pretty fucking awful and this was also at the time he was born in 1842 mm-hmm. and so although the, he was born was, in new, he was born in new jersey so that was a he wasn't a slave he was not but a he slave was still racist as fuck oh yeah and i mean his parents were extremely poor and so Good old P.T. Barnum picks him up and has him be part of his sideshow. He was one of his most lucrative acts. But he was billed as the monkey man. Yes. And he had kind of a sign on his display where he was like displayed in a cage. 
where he was often like shrieking and screaming and that was part of like his his bit i guess was to kind of appear as wild yes they didn't want him to talk they didn't want him to use they actually paid him not to talk a dollar a day not to talk Mm -hmm. although a dollar a day in 1860 is a fuck ton of money that is a lot of money anyways on his on his cage or whatever uh he had it written what is it yes yes that was actually uh something that charles dickens who was a friend of pt barnum said when he went and saw his his menagerie and saws up the pinhead what is it and pt barnum's like hey i like that yeah let's paint a sign and put it on his cage Ugh, yikes. However, uh... There's another... There's another one, um... There was another uh, black woman, Joyce Heth, and she was also used in P.T. Barnum's act, and he claimed that she was 161 years old, and she was nursemaid to George Washington. (laughs) Yes. And, uh... And she was also micro... Had microcephaly? Yeah, it doesn't say why she was part of the sideshow, other than... He was trying to, I, I guess it was one of his kind of hoax things. Oh, okay. Just made her look old as fuck? Yeah, just made her look old as okay. fuck and just tried to pass it off that she was born in the island of Madagascar in 1674 and was now the astonishing age of 161 years old. And when she died, he charged admission to her autopsy. Oh, really? It cost 50 cents to get in on that action. Damn. Yeah. Well, we also have Violetta, the limbless woman, born Aloisa Wagner in either 1906 or 1907. She had a condition called Tetra Amelia Syndrome. She did not have any arms or legs. She traveled around Germany for a while and then came to New York in 1924. She worked at Dreamland with the Ringling Brothers and several other sideshows and circuses. She was able to move around by hopping on her torso and she could brush her own hair, thread a needle, and sew using only her mouth. That's crazy. How do you thread a needle with your fucking mouth? I don't know. And hop around on your torso, too. Right? Like, that would... I mean, I have to say, like, I'm pretty put off by this whole free show thing because, obviously, being... Living in the times we are, like, I can see how, like, you know, awful and exploitive that all was. Yes. But I would literally pay to see someone with no arms and legs hopping on their torso up. Right? Have you have you seen the oblongs? <laughs> I haven't. Okay, the oblongs was a cartoon that was on adult on Adult Swim. Mm-hmm. Will Ferrell was the voice of the father, who was someone who had Tetra Amelia syndrome, mm-hmm. and he would just hop around and drive a car and just. It was as if he had limbs. It was quite amusing. It's a very good show. It's hilarious. Wow. I mean, it just seems like that would hurt your junk. Like male or female, if you're just hopping around on your torso. They actually cover that in the cartoon. Do they? So, if you get a chance, you should watch that cartoon. It's fucking hilarious. Wow. You know, also, besides Tetra Amelia Syndrome, there's another reason people can also be born without limbs, is there's a whole generation of people uh, because of thalidomide. Really? Remember thalidomide babies? Oh, yes. Yes, well, yeah, they discovered thalidomide and and actually gave it to pregnant women to... um, Stop morning sickness. Yes, yes. Except that it caused horrible deformities. It basically caused them to be born without arms and legs or little. If they did have anything, it was like one of those tiny little like baby. Yeah, it's called phocomelia. Arms. Yeah. And the symptoms are underdeveloped limbs, uh, pelvic bones may be absent, mm-hmm. hands and arms may be missing, or the fingers can be fused, thumbs missing. The name of this disorder is from ancient Greek words meaning seal and limb, like the animal seal. Mm-hmm. So this is this is normally the cause of that drug that they were giving women for morning sickness, yeah. thalidomide, which they don't do that anymore. However, yes. they still use that drug, just not for morning sickness. It's right. for like fucking cancer and shit mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, See, that but... is that is different because you still normally will have the limb. It just will be well. There's a reason they call it the seal limb and it's because Mm -hmm. it's very much like a flipper with the fused digits and everything right and it's terrible when this was given to women i mean obviously it wasn't done for very long because it pretty quickly they They figured out it was terrible yeah (laughs) like here you're pregnant let's give you this drug that makes your baby hideously deformed but this was during a time too when abortion was illegal right 
So, so you had to either leave the country or, you know, trust some shady doctor. Or something, Or yeah. you just had the baby. So there's, like, basically just a whole lot of babies that were born, I don't know, I'm hoping it was all, like, around the same year or something. I hope it didn't take too long for them to figure out. Oh, I doubt it. What was going on with the thalidomide and that that was a terrible, terrible mistake. Yeah, I had a substitute, substitute teacher in the fifth grade who had a focomelia. Hmm. It was, I didn't know. I had no idea. I'd never seen it. And this is going to sound terrible, but I thought that she was an alien. Mm-hmm. Like the aliens from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Krang. Because that's what her arms look like, is those kind of tentacles that Krang right. has. And I completely believed that that was the case, that right. she was a Krang alien from Dimension X. Mm -hmm. She wasn't. No. Her parents probably were just given thalidomide when she was in utero. And so, you know. And some unfortunate results ensued. Yes. CeeLo the Seal Boy. His real name is Stanley Barrent. He had Focomelia. His hands were pretty much just sticking out of his shoulders. Mm -hmm. And the main part of his act was to shave his face with a straight razor, smoke a cigar, and saw a crate using a handsaw. With his little flipper hand? With his, yeah, well, both of his arms were, hands were like that. They both basically came out of his shoulders. Mm -hmm. it was, there was no arm. It was just shoulder and then hands. Right. Maybe with a bit of wrist. But he performed for 35 years before retiring, and he just died of sickness in 1980. Oh, okay. Another one that results in limbs being not fully developed is called ectodactyly. This is when the center digits are missing or fused to the outer digits on the hands and the feet, so they kind of resemble claws. Oh, are we going to talk about Lobster Boy now? Oh, yeah. This one actually occurs in frogs and toads, cats and dogs, mice, salamanders, cows chickens, marmosets, and the West Indian manatee. Wow. Very, very rare. All of these are remarkably rare. This brings us to Grady Styles, Lobster Boy. Grady was the sixth generation of his family that was born with electrodactyly and got into performing at a young age because his father performed in a traveling circus. Grady grew up to be a fucking dick. That is to say, he was abusive and alcoholic. In 1978, the night before his oldest daughter was to be married, he shot the groom. He confessed and was convicted of third-degree murder, of which he served how much time do you think, Joanna? None at all, actually. None at all. He was given 15 years of probation. There was no prisons that were equipped to deal with that person with his condition, so yeah, he just got 15 years probation. Although, I mean, aside from the fact that he just had, like, lobster claw hands, I don't really... And feet. Yeah, and feet. I just don't understand how that kept them from being able to, to imprison him. I don't know. There is this tribe. I believe it's in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. But due to tribal rules on who you can marry, mm -hmm. there is one specific people there that have a large, a large population of people with ectrodactyly. Mm -hmm. And they aren't considered disabled at all. Right. They're able to do everything else the people without the condition are able to do. In fact, they're actually better at climbing trees because of their feet not having all those toes in the middle. They can... Oh, nifty. So they aren't considered, and they are able to do everything. They're not considered disabled. They're, mm -hmm. they're just as able as everybody else there. So, Yeah, I mean, I just don't, I just don't understand the reasoning behind that because it's not as if he required you know round the clock medical care or something i mean he just had deformed hands and feet i'll bet you because i feel like the prison system is probably filled with people who have like some kind of physical deformity i bet you it's because since it was something that was so severe i mean it was very obvious he had it he was protected under whatever laws and so he wasn't it was like a I think it was like a payoff thing. Maybe. And they just kind of cited that as the reason. Maybe. I think there was something more to that because really, I just don't, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense that they, they weren't equipped to deal with him. Or maybe he just played it off like it was a bigger deal than it was. Definitely. Or maybe in a more first world society, it is a greater disability than in some place where you climbing trees is considered 
a useful skill. Mm-hmm. I mean, you couldn't type very quickly. I'm or maybe saying, you could. I don't know. In the American prison system, I'm sure there are tons and tons of people that, you know, have had Lim, you know that are amputees and all sorts of all sorts of things going on that doesn't keep them from being put in prison and certainly not back in the day right so i just i just think there was something a little bit more going on there it's either, possible it is either possible. he played it up they didn't want to deal or it was some kind of like you know like dude this guy's really famous like do we want the bad press from this mm-hmm. do we really want to put lobster boy in prison for the rest of his life for murder so instead, they gave him 15 years probation. And if anything, he had no remorse over no. killing his daughter's would-be husband. No. If, if anything, he, it, it made his behavior even worse because then he had kind of like, I'm untouchable attitude He basically on. just killed someone. Well, no, not mm-hmm. basically. He exactly killed someone, he admitted exactly to it, killed someone. and got a slap on the claw. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. So I guess that was a, a thing too, is that he he liked to remind people that he'd gotten away with it once and that he could do it again. Right. So I would hope if he shot someone else and killed them and was just like, Nope, did it again, they would put him away, but Right. It's hard but to say. It's hard to say because he met with the violent death himself, apparently after putting up with all of this abuse and threats for so many years, his wife hired a fellow sideshow performer his name was chris wyatt she gave him fifteen hundred dollars and in 1993 he went into the home and shot lobster boy three times and killed him in the back of the head while he was watching tv and his son from a previous wife was also in on it with his current wife yeah but yeah i mean it's like the whole family was kind of in on it they just wanted him gone because he was just a a dick bag yeah he was just a horrible person to live with and they couldn't deal with it anymore Uh, but that was the end of mr styles that was the end of mr styles another person i'd like to talk about real quick here is robert ripley do you remember ripley's believe it or not oh yeah that's that's this guy interesting He was the namesake and creator of the show. Well, it wasn't a well. I guess it was always kind of a show. It just wasn't always a television show. He was also the first person to broadcast from underwater. In the sky, falling with a parachute. Underground, from mid-ocean to America, from South America and Australia to America, and from London to every country in the world at the same time, using a bunch of translators. He opened up a bunch of auditoriums all over the place to display the strange collections of things he'd found in his travels, including human oddities. He went to some 200 countries in a few years. He was just all over the place all the time. He was a pretty interesting fella. He died on May 27th, 1949. He had a heart attack on stage of his television show while discussing the military funeral song Taps. Hmm. Believe it or not. A banker in 1900 was in Manchuria, China, where he found a man and took his picture. This man, his name is Wang, and he had a 13-inch horn growing out of the back of his head. That's 33 centimeters. Robert Ripley was the person this picture was sent to, and Robert Ripley wrote a letter to Wang, offering him cash to be an exhibit at his auditorium. Wang, the human unicorn, as he's called, never replied and was never heard from again. I'm not sure what makes a horn grow out of someone's head, though. It's a skin disease. Ah. It's a skin disorder. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. It's an overgrowth of uh, keratin, I believe. Is that what your fingernails are made out of? Mm-hmm, exactly. Ah. So there's actually a lot of there's actually a lot of people that have this problem. They're just usually not quite so pronounced. Right. Or maybe they shave it down or something. Yeah, they usually see a dermatologist and have it shaved down long before it reaches, you know, a giant horn. Right, right. But I guess in 1900s Manchuria, not a lot of uh 
Right, not a lot of dermatologists out there. I would imagine. Another famous performer is General Tom Thumb. Born as Charles Sherwood Stratton, at six months old, he stopped growing. In 1847, when he was nine, he began to grow again, very, very slowly. Charles was two foot eight and a half inches on his 18th birthday, that's 82 and a half centimeters, and ended up growing to a height of three foot four inches, that's 102 centimeters. P.T. Barnum discovered this kid who ended up touring with him at, at five and eventually was a business partner of Barnum. You know, I heard that he was actually related to Barnum in oh, was some he? way. Yeah. I'm not sure. The source I didn't I had didn't, didn't say how he was related, but that he was a relation of P.T. Barnum's. That could explain why he was a business partner. Yeah, because a lot of times, you know, I mean, they paid him, but they didn't make him like a business partner. Yeah, he did pretty well financially, and he lived pretty well. And he married another little person. And he escaped a hotel fire in Milwaukee that killed 71 people. He just barely got out and then died of a stroke six months later. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Again with the fires, you know? Fire codes back in the 1800s were probably non-existent. Yeah. Maybe it's because so many people died in fires around during those times that at some point they were like, you know, maybe we need to do something about this. Maybe when we like build buildings, we have to make it so that it's kind of like the Titanic, how they didn't have enough fucking lifeboats. Right. Just... At some point enough people die and you're like, yeah, maybe we need to make it so that there's exits and more than one way in and out of the building. Right. Yeah. Maybe you don't make it out of fucking charcoal or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not have, gasoline running through the entire building walls maybe <laughs> but yeah the very least let's make some let's make it escapable let's put in right. fire escapes and another to... of barnum's discoveries underage discoveries was four-legged myrtle corbin she was born in texas with dipigus dipigus is when you the lower half of the body splits and makes two complete Usually pelvises with legs, although sometimes they can make extra organs as well. Mm -hmm. So she had two regular legs and then two like baby like legs, baby legs that were hanging mm -hmm. between her regular legs. But she could use those legs too. She could move them around and everything. A little bit, yeah. I mean, they weren't like walking legs no, because no. of their, you know. So she began working with Barnum, as I said, at thirteen. Later, she worked with Ringling Brothers, and then she also worked on Coney Island. Coney Island, that's the one in New York, its freak show opened in 1880. It was called Dreamland, but really it wasn't until 1904 that it really got big. There was this miniature city they built there called the Lilliputia. It was scaled for dwarf inhabitants. Specifically, it was built to resemble Nuremberg, Germany, in the 1400s. And so all of these dwarves would live there and they had their own parliament and all this shit. And so they would just act like they were. This is almost, this is making me thinking of the Wizard of Oz. A little bit. They just act like their own 1400s <laughs> German folks. And then they get to do regular shit when there's, when the park is closed. This was such a success that its owner, Samuel W. Gumpertz, began searching out other unique humans. And then another guy from 22 to 41, Professor Samuel Wagner, Professor, quote-unquote, Samuel Wagner, I'm doing the air quotes here, yeah. ran a sideshow called World Circus Sideshow that was also at Coney Island. Uh, when most of the sideshows displaying human oddities went out, most of the freak shows began to fail. But Coney Island didn't. It just changed to focus its performers. It just changed to focus on performers like Fire Eaters and People that lay on bed of nails and that sort of thing. They actually, mm -hmm. to this day, have a freak show there. Interesting. I'd kind of like to go. Me too. I'd check that out for sure. So Myrtle, one of the more successful ones. Oh, yeah. She only worked for five years. Yeah, because she retired at age 18 because she had made so much money. And she got married. Mm -hmm. and had, she had five kids. Three of which came out of one vagina, two of which came out of the other. 
and that's you know rumored i mean we don't actually know that for sure right but i like the idea of there being you like the idea of there being two vaginas well just like the whole like the baby kind of comes out it's like pinball you don't know where it's going to come out <laughs> makes it harder for the midwife or the doctor they don't know where they're going to catch right just, well it just i'm sure they know because the one that i don't know if they both dilate at the same time or what i don't know no i mean i I feel like you would actually have to have, like, a whole set. Like, I don't think that you have one uterus with two vaginas coming out of it. I have no idea. Like, I don't I don't think – I I feel like it would, she would have to have, like, two completely different sets. Maybe – I mean, was it, like, the one that was used to impregnate her? I mean, if she I had don't two know. of them. Like I don't maybe know. That, I have questions. Maybe, yeah, I have many questions about this. Like, maybe, because, I mean, if you have two to choose from, maybe whichever one it came out of is because that was the whichever one that was. Whichever one it yeah. went in, yeah. Mm-hmm, exactly. Maybe, maybe. This one's actually making me blush a little bit. You know, <laughs> I, I'm pretty, I'm not a very modest person, but I'm just like, oh, my. <laughs> but when, when it comes to multiple vaginas, that's where Joanna draws the line. Right? Well, just like, you know, that's got to be some weird sex involved there. Two sets of legs, two vaginas, and yeah, I mean, that would be my guess with that she has two completely different Wherever it's fired is where the baby comes out. Exactly. Like, she has two uteruses, too, and wherever it was. But that just seems very odd. Yes. Yes, it does. Although there was a three-legged man that was also on the slideshow, and he had two dicks. But that wasn't Dipagus, was it? Wasn't that uh, one of the... I think that was like a, a parasitic, a, a parasitic twin, twin situation. Twin, yeah, I'm pretty but sure that's what it was. But he definitely had two sets of junk. Did they both work? I don't know. He had three legs and two dicks. That's what we're wondering. We just want to know about the junk. Does the junk mm-hmm. still work? Yeah, that's what everyone wants to know about. That's true. Normally we talk about Wookiee dicks, but now <laughs> now we've got if multiple... Wookiee dicks. What have you. Bigfoot dicks. Yes. Now it's like, but it, when it gets to be like one person with multiples, it's just like, damn, like, what is that about? What does that look like? That is the question burning in my mind right now. And on your cheeks. <laughs> yeah. Who else do we have here? We've got Lionel, the lion faced man. Mm hmm. His name is Christian Ramos. His mother got rid of him at age four. Because she thought he was, like, a fucking demon or something? Well, no. So when she was pregnant, she saw the father get mauled by a lion. And then through an unfortunate set of circumstances, he just happens to be born with a condition known as hypertrichosis. Yes. So he was covered in fur. Mm Mm-hmm. And his mother gave him to this dude named Settlemayer, who exhibited him throughout Europe. So probably, I don't know if he was nice to him or not. It doesn't really say. In 1901, Ramos left Poland and came to America at the age of 10, where he began working with Barnum and Bailey's and at Coney Island. Moved to Germany in the late 20s and then died of a heart attack in 1932. Mm. So he moved back to the where, where that he was came like from. war-torn mm-hmm. right after World War One, and then died just before World War Two. So I have a pretty weird story about one of the people with um, hypertrichosis. All right. So she was known as the bear woman or the ape woman. Her real name, however, was uh, Julia Pastrana, or maybe it was she was from Mexico, so it was possibly pronounced Julia, Julia Pastrana. She was born in 1834 in Sinaloa, Mexico. And she had hypertrichosis, so... Obviously, her face was very uh, hairy, kind of fur-like hair covered her face and body. She also had a secondary condition, uh, which caused her nose and her ears to be large in size, like abnormally large in size. Oh, wow. So that really gave her kind of a... Animalistic appearance. Yeah, like an an ape-like appearance. And so she had a... A manager and she performed in Broadway in New York City. She sang and danced and she would um, sing Spanish folk songs. And 
had a, had a pretty um, lucrative career. She met her husband in 1854. His name was Theodore Lentz. And from that point on, he became her manager. And in 1860, she was on tour in Moscow with her husband. And she gave birth to a baby boy. And she died of complications of childbirth, which many women it did a at lot the time. Back then, yeah. The baby boy also had hypertrichosis, and he died when he was three days old. Okay. So the husband had her body and the baby's body mummified. Loving father. Yes. And husband. Yes. Did so, he then travel around and display the corpses? He just hung on to them. I just hung on to them. He hung on to them, and he actually married another, like, bearded... He married a bearded lady. So, bearded lady and people who are styled as these ape people, they're two different things. Hypertrichosis right. is where it's hair all over. Yes. Hirsutism is where a woman grows hair in areas that generally only men do. Right. Probably because of a cruel hormonal imbalance of some kind. Yes, it's something of that nature. Mm -hmm. There was Jean Carroll, the bearded lady that became the tattooed lady. So she worked in a sideshow as a mm -hmm. bearded lady. Very lucrative. She and a contortionist named John Carson were into each other, but John couldn't get past the beard, and Jean didn't want to give up the job. Her solution... She got the beard removed using electrolysis and then got her entire fucking body tattooed. Hmm. They got married, and she got to continue working now as the tattooed lady. Interesting. Yeah. Just didn't just didn't care for the beard, huh? John didn't like the beard. I can see that. I, I wouldn't like the beard either. I mean, it was unfortunate way back in the day they didn't have electrolysis. So Yeah, this was if, in— If you were one of those women who had the bearded lady, I mean— you were just kind of stuck with it unless yep. you wanted to shave like five times a day. Yep. On Yulia Pastrana, interesting fact though. So you know how her husband went on to marry a bearded lady? Yes. Uh, he died in 1884 in a mental institution in Russia. So apparently he went crazy. Interesting. After she died, he married a, berry, a bearded lady. Probably, you know, I mean, he had her body mummified. Right. His son's body mummified. So maybe it wasn't to be a weirdo. Well, I mean... Well, it was weird, that's for sure. Yeah. It was weird and unhealthy, and then he tries marrying this bearded lady, I don't know, maybe as a replacement to her. Just because, wasn't enough hair. Because he called her Zenora Pastrana. So he gave her, like, the la the his wife's maiden last name. Oh. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, he kind of insisted on calling her like this very variation of his wife's name, and at some point, I guess he went into a Russian mental hospital in 1884, which I can't even imagine how lovely of a place that must have been. Oh, I, oh, mental hospital! Absolutely, any place on the planet in 1884 was probably a just a shit oh, show. Man, so somehow the bodies of Pastrana and her child uh, ended up in Norway. It doesn't say how. But they surfaced in 1921, and they were exhibited somewhere in Oslo, I believe, until 1970. The bodies were sent for exhibition in the USA, and vandals broke into the storage facility and <laughs> mutilated the baby. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. So, eventually... After many more years, and I don't know who really stepped in to do this, but... Yulia's body was eventually sent back to Mexico and buried in her well, hometown. That's I nice. Yeah, yeah, but it, I mean, it took a really, really long time for yeah. them to. Yeah, that is sort of wow. Yeah, it was. It wasn't until August of two thousand twelve, or actually, that that's just when it was reported. Never mind. So it wasn't until February of two thousand thirteen that the body was turned over to the government of Sinaloa and her burial was done what? February 12, 2013. And I guess hundreds of people attended her funeral. So finally, 2013 is when she got buried, sent back to her hometown and buried after being basically on display 
for decades and decades in life and in death that's yeah because i mean she died in like what it was you know 18 1860 is when she died it's insane isn't that crazy and she's not the only person to have had this done actually really yeah so this was so one of the sideshow giants his name was Edouard Beaupre. Oh. Yes. And, you know, I believe we probably listed him in our Giants episode because he was one of the guys that ended up being over eight feet tall. He was eight foot three inches. Was he the tallest man ever? No, the tallest man ever was like nine feet tall almost. Oh, okay. He was like eight foot 11 or something. Oh, okay. So this guy was just, this a, guy was, just a little guy. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite. Nine feet tall, eight foot three inches was his maximum height. He did die young from a pulmonary hemorrhage at age 23, which is not unusual. No. Because of, you know, again, your circulation. Heart isn't, yeah, your heart isn't meant to pump through such a large body. No, it's all sorts of complications yeah. from that. When he died, his body was sent to be embalmed and prepared for burial. And apparently he was supposed to go back to Saskatchewan, which is where William Burke, the circus manager, who who was like his manager, was based out of. But he didn't want to actually deal with like the cost of shipping his body back there. Right. So Burke instead convinced his parents to bury him in St. Louis so that he so wouldn't – yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to send back because it would cost a lot i mean he's a big guy he is but a big come guy on, man he is a big guy i'm sure this so manager in order was to, rolling in the dough yeah so in order to you know spare spare everyone the cost of uh shipping the body he's like let's just bury him here in st louis which is where he had died and the family said okay and they believed that the funeral had took took place because i guess they weren't there so maybe burke contacted them and said i'm so sorry your son is dead we're gonna go ahead and bury him here instead of sending him back to saskatchewan and they believed that the funeral took place but instead burke skipped town and stiffed the embalmers the money of just like embalming him and everything what the fuck yeah what a jack off. Yeah, I mean, he basically did like a dine and dash, except yeah. with a dead person. A die and dash. <laughs> That's fucked up. So, the funeral director, who was the guy who, you know, embalmed him and then. Couldn't Burke's, build a. Yeah, yeah, and then Burke skips town and he's just kind of left with his body. To make up for his financial loss, they put Edward's body on display in the storefront window. In hopes of making like some kind of profit or wow. some kind of like advertisement for their services as funeral I'll directors, be damned, and the family never knew. Right? Yeah, the family had no idea. They thought that the funeral had actually taken wow, place that, that he had been buried up. in St. Louis. People will do some fucked up things, right? And so when they were left with his body, and the guy didn't even you know pay for what they had done, they're like, let's put his let's let's put him on display. Let's put this eight foot three giant dead body in our storefront window in hopes of attracting like more customers i wonder if so, it worked <laughs> <laughs> and it did work it it caused so much um so many people were constantly outside of the building and holding up you know traffic and the the general area that the authorities eventually forced them to remove it oh, from wow. its storefront display you're just, just causing too much traffic. Yeah, guys. like, exactly. So, Bupre's body was sold two times after that. So, I guess whoever no ran shit. the funeral home sold his body to somebody. And then that person sold his body to somebody else. And eventually, he ended up in the Eden Museum of Quebec. Got closer. You know, closer yeah. to this house. Closer Saskatchewan. to Saskatchewan than St. Louis, that's for certain. That is true. That is true. So a circus had purchased it, I guess, in 1907. And 
his body was in a shed in Montreal because the circus that had purchased it had apparently gone bankrupt. Oh, right. And so they just had a storage shed somewhere. So, yeah, and... they just had a storage se- shed somewhere and his body was just chilling. Fuck. Literally, if he's in literally, fucking Montreal. Yeah, literally chilling in a storage facility. So then his body came uh, into the possession of a doctor by the name of Louis Napoleon Delorme, and he worked at the University of Montreal. He mummified Edouard and placed him on display uh, for the Faculty of Medicine. So I guess, you know, he was still at this point just embalmed, but maybe he had just been, you know, in storage sheds or cold temperatures. Yeah, so he was... But this guy actually went... um, took it a step further and actually had his corpse mummified. Right. And then he was on display in the faculty of medicine. He was there for 85 years. Jesus. Yeah. And so in 1975, Edward's nephew petitioned the university to release the, release the remains. Yeah. I don't even know. I mean, how did this guy even find out? I have no idea. But in 1989, the university cremate, uh, cremated the body, and his ashes were sent back to his family, and that's wow. where he finally, <laughs> that's where his adventure, his post-death adventure ended. Yeah, that was a hell of a, hell of a thing. Yeah, so he was known as the Willow Bunch Giant. And I guess, yeah, uh, July 7th, 1990 was his actual burial date i guess when they you know put his ashes into the ground or yeah whatever. yeah or spread them or, or whatever Mm-hmm. so 1990 wow so that's a that's a long fucking time that from, is a long time yeah from when he died which i believe let me it doesn't say the actual year of his death i don't think but the earliest i see that was was after he had been he was found in 1907 in that shed in montreal yeah it's crazy mm-hmm so quite some time, probably probably a good hundred years, I imagine. Had more miles on his corpse than on his living body. Right, because he was only twenty three when he died. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, but we... Yeah, it's weird to think that so many people have mummies and stuff. Like I know, just people's preserved corpses. It's like kicking you know, around. Yeah, in fucking sheds and right whatever and then oh yeah i sold it to this person and the shed in my backyard i've got a lawnmower and then i've got my weed whacker and then Mm -hmm. there's the the court the mummy that i keep in there yeah oh okay yeah Yeah. i'd like to take a look at that sometime sure sure (laughs) we mentioned briefly earlier chang and ang yes they were chang and ang bunker born in 1811 they had a small piece of cartilage joining them at the sternum and with two complete livers that were also joined these guys are the originators of the term Siamese twins. Because they were born in Siam? Yes. At age 18, they started a world tour as a curiosity with a manager named Robert Hunter. After the contract was up with him, they went into business for themselves. Eventually, they settled on a plantation in North Carolina. Where they actually owned slaves. Did you know that? I expected as much if they lived on a plantation in North Carolina and it was before the Civil War. Yes. Because why else would you do all of that? <laughs> I just thought it was interesting because, you know, they were like sold into the circus. I mean, they're basically kind of treated as like non-humans and put on display and and then, then they in turn just, go yeah. ahead and and become slave owners and also like dehumanize people yep they married sisters adelaide and sarah ann yates and between the two of them they sired 21 kids so again always with a threesome mm-hmm. or maybe well, it, was, it was like a foursome is it a foursome or a forgy i don't know huh i've never even heard that term well there you go this is that a... goes to show how how in the know i am about such things that's true <laughs> In 1874, Ang woke up one morning and found Chang dead. That's because Chang actually had kind of a bit of a drinking problem and stuff. He he kind of ruined that half of the liver. Oh, yeah, it's a good thing they had two complete livers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doctors tried an emergency separation, 
But, you know, it was 1874. Right. And Aang died three hours later. A death cast was made of them. And they pre- and the preserved liver they still have. It's at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. Interesting. You know, a death cast It's of mm-hmm. their whole torso, the whole upper section. So you can see where they were conjoined. Yeah. And then the liver just chilling there. Just chilling. Yep. So there's another really fucked up, like, death cast story. And this is kind of one of the fucked up, like, racist stories, too. So there was a woman, and she was basically plucked right out of her tribe in Africa. Her name was Sarah Bartman, and she was discovered in Cape Town, Africa. And uh, it was a British military doctor named William Dunlop. And he basically was fascinated with the fact that she had a really huge ass. All right. Mm -hmm. So he was an ass man. (laughs) I guess so. And apparently having a really big ass and actually and also uh, elongated labia is a physical trait among the tribe that she belonged to, the um, the Khoisan tribe. So so lots of women women. Right. Right. But she kind of stood apart because she was even more endowed. So so she had the biggest ass. Mm -hmm. She had the biggest ass. And And labia. (laughs) Yes. Although it it mostly um, addresses her her big butt. Okay. Sir Mix a lot approved. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I'd say so. She was given the name hot and tot venus oh yeah yeah hot and tot venus yes and hot and tot was the name uh given by white europeans um to the koi koi people so it's it's considered like an an offensive term a derogatory term yes and she was put on display in a sideshow in london and then eventually moved to paris at some point, people just kind of lost interest, and the money stopped stopped rolling in, and she actually had to um, become a prostitute. Oh, God. In order to survive. Right. Yes. And she died in 1815 at the age of 25. Oh, Jesus. From what did it say? It doesn't say, just that, you know, because of the, the abuse that she probably endured and... You know, I mean, people died young for all sorts of reasons, and I'm sure ending up in a life of prostitution or being a sex worker probably did not help. No, probably not. Especially during that time. I mean, you picked up all sorts of bad disease and what have you. Yes, it was not not a great time. No, definitely not. So, anyways, she dies 1815 at the age of 25, and at that point, a French scientist named... uh, George Cuvier, he did a plaster cast of her body, and then he proceeded to remove her brain and genitalia and place them in jars in the Musée d'Homme in Paris, where they were on display for 160 years. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. He said it, it removed her skeleton as well, so... I'm guessing, like, maybe he had her, like, kind of, like, the meat removed from the bone. Yeah, something. So that she was, like, maybe, like, a display skeleton. But but he actually, like, cut out cut out her hoo-ha and her brain Fuck. and had those put separately. Preserved into, in a jar. Yeah, preserved in a jar and put on display. And it was actually uh, Nelson Mandela is is the one who requested that Bartman's remains be returned to Africa. Yeah, no shit. And that finally happened in 2002. Oh, wow. Mm Mm-hmm. Very, very recently. Yeah, a lot of these were really recent. I mean, that giant guy, that was like 1990. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, getting to be a long time ago, but not... Still, it's not... Still. And then that that gal from Mexico... Yeah. that That was 2013, and then this gal got returned to Africa in 2002. But it's just like, dude, what is wrong with some of these people? <laughs> a lot of it is. Yeah, I know. It seems like you just 
when asked you'd be like yeah sure like let's go ahead and give up this skeleton that we kind of got in a fucked up way anyway i mean yeah you know the history of these things why don't you just if you're not going to do it proactively you know before mm-hmm. you get asked to to do it then why don't you just do it when asked oh yep no right. problem you're right my bad mm-hmm. we shouldn't hold on to this this is kind of fucked up we have it anyway right i mean people dying under tragic circumstances being yeah. exploited and dying under tragic circumstances and then they get further exploited even in death basically yep so that's, that's, that's it's pretty great. sad yeah. it's pretty sad another one that's that's very sad is um some of these sideshow freaks were actually like kidnapped as children oh i believe that entirely yeah so another story about some young people that were just basically like kidnapped and exploited uh where the story is the story of the muse brothers george and willie and in 1899 they were on their farm in truvine virginia and basically lured by a guy with candy, the classic stranger with candy story that we, you know, always warn kids about. Right. Don't get in the van. Exactly. All now the reason pre van. <laughs> now these these brothers were black but they were albino. So probably whoever lured them knew that they could, you know, make a buck off of Oh yeah, well this time where human oddities were on display, they could you know, it was free, a free for all, basically. Mm-hmm. They were Albano, but they were still black, so of course, you know. Second class citizens. Yeah, and uh, if even that during this time, oh, Jesus Christ, man. so bad, so bad, disgusting. But, anyways, after quite some time, where you know whoever took them, I guess probably had them on display. I guess they they traveled as far as Buckingham Palace. And in 1923, they were purchased by the Ringling Brothers because, again, uh, these these guys were basically treated as non-humans. Right. As basically a commodity. Like livestock. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it took their mother 28 years to liberate them. So they're kidnapped in 1899. They're taken around by whoever. It doesn't really... Probably specified. several different circuses or sideshows since yeah. there were so many that would tour, especially because the big two places was mm-hmm. America and England. Right. So spent some time over in England, went to Buckingham Palace, back to America where they were purchased by the Ringling Brothers in 1923. They were dubbed as Barnum's Monkey Men. They weren't allowed to have any kind of say over how they were, how they got to dress or anything like that. They had them basically in their hair long dreadlocks and were also referred to as the ambassadors from mars and this was the time 1923 after the ringling brothers and barnum and bailey got together so that's mm-hmm. why they were barnum's monkey men but the ringling brothers purchased purchased them. purchased them quote unquote i mean that's just so fucked up right and basically they are forced to portray cannibals and other demeaning characters so eco and ico the south american the ecuadorian cannibals mm-hmm so, yeah, I guess eventually their their mother got them back, but it took 28 years and a whole lot of red tape, I'm sure, because... Which shouldn't be the case. You should right, just be able to get your fucking family people. back. Right, because these are fucking people, yeah. And it's <laughs> that not they like, shouldn't have been taken in the first place. No, they were kidnapped. they were fucking kidnapped. That's were, a federal crime. Exactly, and but yeah. They were kidnapped and taken to fucking England. Mm-hmm. Like, that's... Yeah, and then bought and sold. I mean, this is what after... What the fuck is that? This is after slavery this has been well abolished. This is well after slavery. So, I mean, not quite a hundred years, but still. So, but it's still people are just still gonna like turn a blind eye to people being bought and sold. Oh, especially where they were in Virginia. Yeah, where the kids it's were just, stolen. The so. whole thing is just, it's pretty it's awful fucked up. And it fucked is up super and, fucked up. Yeah, and I have one more where it was, uh, a case of a kidnapping and also an albino. Except this guy was an aborigine from Australia. Right. So he was an albino aborigine. And he was born in uh, New South Wales in 1868 and was basically just uh, captured by by an Englishman, some random asshole passing through who, again, was like, oh, hey, look at this I can make a guy. buck off this. I can make a buck off this. And at some point, he ended up in the United States in um, 
in the 1890s and ended up as a as a sideshow freak and was dubbed the Australian with a remarkable head because his hair was six feet long in circumference, but pure white since he was albino. Crazy. Yeah. Don't really have any further information on the rest of his life other than he was just kidnapped and probably never made it back to Australia. Hopefully he did, but unfortunately, you're right, he probably did not. Right. Well, I've got another one here. We have Ella Harper. Camel Girl. Ella was born with congenital genu recurvatum, which causes the knees to bend backwards. I would recommend Googling a picture of her because it really is very strange looking. It is very strange looking. It's definitely one that just like sticks sticks out. It, it's where the knee joint is deformed, and so it, it just gives your knee a wider range of motion it actually goes backwards it go it like hyper extends in the opposite direction that it should that's right and it usually happens in women and it's very rare but it was so rare to be almost unheard of before 1880 there's really only one reference to this girl and that was she was she was a feature in a circus called the wh harris's nickel plated circus from 1885 to 1887 she shows up in censuses mm -hmm. down the line here did and you, there. Did you read that WordPress blog? I read. I skimmed it. I skimmed it, too, because, oh, my God. It was long. It was long. Very detailed and long. I mean, this um, this guy was very um, thorough in his research of finding out what happened to her. But basically, she quit the business rather early, probably because, you know, it's just a very demeaning and yeah way to have to make money yeah so she goes home and ends up not marrying until she was 35 years old she had a child she did get married and had a child who only lived for a few months and then she adopted a child who also died within two to three months jesus and then a few years later she herself died of colon cancer so pretty pretty sad life for yeah, girl. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It that's, is unfortunate. That's not great. And then here's one where this guy was a pretty big oddity. He was he wasn't born with a a physical deformity other than he didn't seem to have uh any sense of pain. So he's one of those oh, human pincushion guys. Yeah. And this guy is a pretty famous one. So his name was Mirin Dejo. And he was in the sideshows in the 1940s. So he would actually impale himself with a sword. Oh, crazy. Yeah. Like in the, in the torso? Yeah, like there's a picture of him and the, it's, it's almost like a fencing sword. So it's one of those really thin ones. Like a rapier? Yeah, like a like yeah, like yeah. A, like a needle. Yeah, yeah. Sword almost, and it's going like directly. It's going in through his back, through and protruding through his nipple. Oh Jesus! Yeah, he must just be really good at getting around organs, right? And I don't, I just don't get it how that doesn't hurt at all. But well, I know that when one is a masochist, it's because the brain misfires and pain is instead of felt as pleasure so it's probably something similar to that yeah where the the pain receptors simply don't fire or whatever yeah and people were so um skeptical over his performances that he actually had x-rays done <laughs> to show that the things yeah, no, actually went yeah, through yeah this isn't some sort of trick there's actually a whole sword going through my torso. You'd think you'd put it through your hand so you could show people. Well, probably he did, but I mean, obviously putting it through your torso is yeah, uh, that's that's big. That's big. I mean, you want to go big with these kinds of things, I guess. I guess so. I mean, he probably made some pretty big money. Yeah, but unfortunately, he if he did, he didn't get to enjoy it very much because he died at age 35 because oh. he ingested a large needle which actually went, I think it ended up in his bloodstream oh, because he swallowed it. Yeah. And it caused an aortic rupture. It went into his heart. And, oh, wow. Yeah, and ruptured his aorta, which is like your big yeah. artery going and through. So he just it, bled it, it's out. the big one. And yeah, he just 
and bled out. Or bled in, as the case may be. Yeah, and it's internal. He couldn't feel the pain, so. And even if he could, I'm not sure if they could have done something about it at that point. Have you heard of the show called Haven? I have not. It was on the sci-fi channel, and it's based on a Stephen King book called, or a Stephen King short story, rather, called Who Killed the Colorado Kid? Mm-hmm. It's very loosely based on the short story, but there is a character in it. There's these things called the Troubles, which are sort of supernaturally things where when you get, you know, one character in specific can't feel any pain. Mm-hmm. There's another character who her touch would always cause pain. So they're kind of like super abilities, but not necessarily controllable or beneficial. Right. And a lot of people have them, and there's it's like five or six seasons. It's a pretty good show. Right. Well, even that episode of the X Files, they had the the one guy who would like he would like nail, like hammer a nail into his nose. Oh yeah. Yeah, and do it through his hands and stuff because I think there's he someone like that at Coney he Island. Could, he could do something where it's like he could control it and like dissociate from it almost. Right, right. No, there's a guy like there's one of those guys at Coney Island like today currently mm-hmm. like we'd go see him today. Right. Ugh crazy shit yeah they have the guys who like drill into their nose with a, yeah. with a hand drill and shit oh people hanging from spikes don't try this at home do stuff. not try this at home yeah these are trained professionals <laughs> yikes well i think that's about all i had except for a couple of you know just general thoughts on the circus is fucked up and uh yeah it was uh, very exploitive to people with uh disabilities even though some of them made a lot of money off of it and it did give many of them and back in a time where they had very few options options yes it wasn't i mean i'm not saying condoning it it's it's not great to do that but i it could be argued that it was better than starving to death on the streets yeah i suppose I in suppose. some ways, but in some ways, but maybe I mean, in other ways, not so much. Yeah, well, just and like well, the definitely ones that, in other ways, not so much. Yeah, well, the ones I mean, kidnapped from their family. Well, if you don't then, have a choice, yeah. that's a completely different story. Mm-hmm. Then you've got your options being taken from you. But then, once you have a choice, if that be that becomes like kind of your only, um, the only way you grow up, and then suddenly, if you're out, you're out. You know, like people aren't interested anymore, and you're kind of like. True. Yeah. Although not just... always, because Zip of the Pinhead, at his funeral, at the funeral home, it was wall to wall packed with people who he worked with, mm-hmm. and he was immensely popular. Right. Amongst his contemporaries, amongst he had tons of friends. Yeah. So in some cases, I'm sure he was being exploited. Yeah, but. Well, it was like the four legged lady. I mean, she made so much money. She retired at age eighteen and yeah, got five married. Years of working. Had her five kids. Questionable about you know the whole their escape routes. <laughs> yeah, their escape routes and the whole double vagina situation. But yeah, I mean, some people worked out. Some people it it didn't so much. And and you wonder how much did that have to do with it? Did their life as a sideshow freak have to do with that? Exactly. And I mean, no one should be exploited at all for anything because it's it's fucked up to do that to people they're all people you think especially with someone who's got some of these disabilities life is shitty enough without people being dick faces to them right and i mean you want to talk about some some fucked up shit that just like this random fact i learned when i was looking through all these uh sideshow freak stories for this episode i found out that i mean well it's pretty it's long been known that circuses have not always been kind to animals oh yeah the the way they have treated their animals elephants elephants in particular they were banned you know they stopped using elephants in 2016 and by 2017 ringling brothers barnum and bailey closed his door forever yep after being on the road for 150 years yep something like that so one really fucked up thing is i found out is that the chimpanzees that they would have do acts they would fucking um, bash out their teeth with a crowbar so they wouldn't bite people. That's fucked up. Yeah. That's completely fucked up. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that that no, happened. No, I didn't either. 
but you know they were often you know they would dress them up as people and make them ride around yeah. tricycles they often performed with the clowns and stuff but yeah in order to keep them from because you know chimpanzees can really fuck you up oh yeah any monkey there's can that fuck you up the oh little yeah ones can that fuck story you of up. that i mean basically it was like bit this lady's face off kind of thing but yeah in order to prevent it wasn't because they didn't do that to people because they were so well trained and well taken care of it's because they, they fucking had no they weapons. had no goddamn teeth because they were crowbarred out of their fucking job and those the are not trainers. stupid animals they they fully comprehended that what was going on they mm-hmm. knew that these people can do this to them that right other things can be done too i mean they're not right it's not well I same mean, with the elephants fuck. and how they treated them oh it's terrible it's so bad. Abs- I, that, and that's why the circus is is closed down yeah that's now why it's the, kind the, of the longest thing of the past. running biggest one I went and see the cir- saw the circus a few times when I was a kid. I was did too. I, I even rode on an elephant. I mean, there's still the, the, like, the circus dole, mm-hmm. but they're not at all like these other circuses were. And I mean, I'm almost I'm a little sorry that my kids never got to see it, but at the same time, I'm kind of glad I never like paid money for my kids to get the circus because to go watch a bunch of animals being being tortured, tortured. Yeah, like I was really upset when their dad took the girls to Sea World down yeah. in. Yeah down in uh, san diego or whatever yeah yeah i was like dude seriously because my daughters come back and they're like yeah like the because i mean the thing the things with the orcas is just so bad oh yeah it's just torture and they're like oh no he jumped and you know he had to do tricks for his food i'm like yeah that's the whole point that's not very Didn't nice we talk about that once i i don't know i feel like we did i don't know if it was on if it was on a show or just we just talked about it huh. in general i don't know Oh, I think I think at some point we did because they killed people. Yeah. Some of those orcas have killed people because they they've gone basically crazy from being in that tiny pool. Yeah, yeah. Where they can do nothing but swim in circles when in nature they actually swim hundreds of miles right. a day. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's like the equivalent of putting somebody in like a room, a room, a them tiny for, yeah. little room where you can hardly even move around, and that's where they are like twenty four seven for years. And yeah, it makes somebody go fucking nuts but i remember as a kid i I loved movies about the circus and i loved circus stories because it was portrayed so much you just didn't know all the fucked up things behind it It, yeah it looked like fun and it was Mm -hmm. yeah not as like i totally wanted to run off and join the circus like that'd be so much fun but unfortunately it would have been terrible and shitty yeah Mm -hmm. probably would have died an alcoholic or something like who knows now, anyone who has any of these conditions or anything and they wish to go display themselves should be more than mm-hmm. more than allowed to because it's their choice as long as it's their choice. Right. And people – there are still people who do all the, the full body tattoos and do all kinds of fire eaters and all that kind of crazy shit. Mm-hmm. Maybe stuff they're not born with that they chose to do, but right. th- those Although, are still things that are like around. Jim is... Rose Circus Sideshow for one and then there's Coney Island for two. But then there's also lots of stuff on, like, YouTube, and I feel like there's, like, kind of a fine line between having something go on that you just kind of want to share with, like, you've got, yeah, I can hammer nails into my face. Like, let's have people come and pay to look at that. But then there's also people, I think, that already are vulnerable. Right. And then they're, in a way, exploited, like, this this feederism thing have you do you know about that i don't it's about like very extreme usually women that are extremely overweight and they have guys that basically want to make them fatter and fatter and they'll have like the videos on youtube which get like millions of subscribers and people watching their journey of basically becoming so fat that they can't even move wow and it's like a turn on for the guy to um to feed them large amounts of food and to make them gain weight. What the fuck? Yeah, it's it's pretty twisted. A huge turn on for them is to feed them um, using I'm a funnel. Oh. It's basically like a beer bong except with food. I yeah. Yeah, it's like they'll put like weight gain shakes in there and then funnel it into them. I mean, this is basically just very slow murder. Yes, exactly. But they will keep doing it because. Not only are they getting all this love and attention from the guy who is feeding them, but also they're making money because all these people on YouTube are watching. They're getting all these hits. Fuck. So, I mean, where do you draw the line there? That's crazy. It's, Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess that's true, but, I mean, if you're... 
But yeah. again, I mean, this is a consenting adult we're talking about. Freedom. So. You've got the freedom to shit on yourself as much as you do to not, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. It's just, I feel like at what point does it kind of cross some sort of line where the people that are watching it are contributing to it? And yeah. I, don't I didn't know. even know that sort of thing existed. Mm hmm. Man. I didn't know about it either until uh, Fortitude. I'm telling you, you got to watch that show. That's the. Uh... Oh, yeah, it sure sounds like it. It doesn't sound <laughs> disturbing at all. <laughs> it covers all sorts of things. <laughs> well, I think that is about all we have. Is that uh, is that the case? That is the case. And uh, it is New Year's Eve, the day that this show is airing. Yes. And don't forget, our new art is done by Cat Thulu Art. Check it out. Facebook.com slash Cat Thulu Art. That's C-A-T-T-H-U-L-U. A R T. All the uh, paintings on there are for sale unless otherwise noted. And everyone have a safe and happy New Year's. You will hear from us in 2018. So we will see you or talk to you rather next year. Yes, we will. So take care now. Do you enjoy the Stranger Than podcast? Please let us know. Rate and comment on iTunes. Check out and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Stranger Than podcast. Our Twitter at underscore stranger than, or drop us an email, stranger than podcast at gmail.com. That's stranger than podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Also, feel free to email us any strange, mysterious, or misunderstood stories or topic suggestions that you'd like to share or hear about.